Welcome to the Ultimate Coach Podcast, Conversations from Being, inspired by the book, The Ultimate Coach, written by Amy Hardison and Alan Thompson. Join us each week with the intention of expanding your state of being, and your experience will be remarkable. Remember, this is a podcast about being. It is a podcast about you. To explore more deeply, visit theultimatecoachbook.com. Now, enjoy today's conversation from B. We are back. Another episode of the Ultimate Coach Podcast. One of the three amazing hosts. This is Ross Weitzer. And I have a special guest today, Nicholas Townsend Smith. And he is the author of The Giant and the Smalls, a remarkable children's book that to me is a key adult book as well. And a high performance coach, leading leaders. And Nick, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Looking forward to the conversation. Who knows where it will go? I Yeah, it's the best way, right? So we'll just go with it. Yeah. So Nick, The Giant and the Smalls. You yeah, got two giants right here. What is your purpose in, I imagine, supporting some smalls out there? Yeah, yeah, it's to get them to wake up. You know, I think that's the biggest thing is a lot of us are just totally unconscious to our lives for a long time. We might even use the language of consciousness, but still be asleep in mm. our world. So we still have these automatic behaviors that are at play. And I think a lot of it stems from my own childhood and development, things that I missed that now I'm facing as an adult. That, that's kind of the message of the book is when we heal ourselves, we can do everything else that we have in mind. And so my vision is to help people heal those inner parts of them so that they can become a giant because it gets in the way. They don't, they don't recognize what's at play. And a lot of it stems from development. And so I take people through 12 journeys where they get to really dive into each of these areas of our lives, you know, from uncertainty to unconsciousness to awareness and grief and gratitude and, Uh, feeling good and giving back and vision, like all these things that are really important in creating yourself as a giant. So my vision is to impact people to where their inner work is done so that they can do their outer work. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I'm curious, was it your professional work that was the initial inspiration of this book? Or was it the fact that you have you have two children? If you have four, yeah, four children, and your desire to create a story that they can at a young age learn from. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was going through my own hardships. It wasn't from my professional experience because I wasn't very professional. I was going in the opposite direction. I was bankrupt. I was foreclosed on. I was getting food at a food bank. I, um, I felt really low, lower Mm. than, than most people do. Well, no, I can't, I can't say that. There's a lot of people that feel really (laughs) low, you know, but I felt low, you know, for my life, I really, was comparing myself, feeling down on myself. Uh, It took years for me to come out of that. But that became the foundation. It was in my darkness that this book came about. It didn't come about because I was feeling good. It came about because I was looking for a way out. And so I had this conversation with Steve Hardison. And I was sitting in the parking lot of the food bank. And that was a catalyst for it, along with all the books I was listening to. So as I talked to him, I'd never had the experience of having somebody listen to you the way he does. And so to sit with him in conversation for an hour in that parking lot before walking in, you know, it just really shifted me. It just showed me that I can do it, uh, demonstrated that that was a possibility to have somebody hold space for my, my darkness was a huge thing because I felt like who, who would want to talk to me? unworthiness, all those feelings that tend to come up when we're feeling really down. And uh, he held space. And so that became foundational when I listened to Who Moved My Cheese, and that inspired the thought of I could write this. That book is just a short allegory or metaphor of, of life. And it was phenomenal. It was a short read. I was like, I love this. And so I was driving to work at my brother's, and I would listen to audiobooks, and I got this recorder. And I started recording this book in the giants and the smalls, and then I'd go home and share it with my kids, but it was inspired by feeling down and out 
looking at the distinction between people who are living giant lives or perceived giant lives and my life, which felt really small, having that conversation with Steve and having him put me on his shoulders, I sat there and I'd imagine on my way to work what it would be like to be coached by Steve, to have somebody like that share how you go from playing small to being a giant in your world. And then I would record it, go transcribe it, and then share it with my kids. And that's the actual recorder right there that I used. So that's that's the foundation of it. Not, not from professionalism, from darkness is where this book came from in a nutshell. I'm curious, what was the creation and turnaround time from feeling like a giant and capable to create and write yeah. this book to what it is today? So that time, I'll tell you that, but the journey's never done. Like I still wake up in the morning and days I'll feel giant and there are days where I feel really small. And so I have to recreate myself. But that was in 2009 when I met with Steve Hardison. I finished the book that year. I tried to get it uh, launched in 2011. I, start, I started a Kickstarter to pay for illustrations and it was a $10,000 goal to pay for these images. And I raised 800 bucks. So I didn't even get close. I, I failed my Kickstarter and I look back now and it's like that, that was perfect timing actually, because we launched in 2020 on the book, March 17th, right when COVID hit and everything shut down, we were going live on the book 2020 and the whole economy shut down again. So back in 2009, that, that was an inspiration for the writing of the book. And then in 2020, our launch was, it wasn't coordinated by uh, on purpose. It just happened to launch on March 17th, 2020, and everything shut down. And so we pushed forward as me and my business partner, Ryan Morris, and uh, we pushed forward and launched anyway. And we had a successful campaign and we got everything covered and printed our first 2,500 copies and just went to work, started building the platform. And where are we yeah. today? Now we have a community. We have a global community called the Tribe of Giants. We have 4,200 members all over the world. Wow. I mean, you're calling in from South Africa. We have a client in South Africa. Uh, we have, well, let's, let's not say client. We have a, somebody that we work with out there. Mm. So we could call that a client. But they're all over the world. We have the Wake Up With Giants TV, Wake Up With Giants radio that now broadcasts into 170 countries. We have school visits that we're doing. We got to speak on stage with Steve Hardison and, and mm. uh, that whole group and the ultimate experience. Uh, in September, we get to be on stage with Tony Schmaltz and Laban Ditchburn and Les Brown and their, their event out there. So it's still, the thing is, is, it's still growing. It's not, there's so much more to do. We're in process of figuring out how to create it into a movie. Like, I don't know how to do that. So we're <laughs> out there chasing every avenue from pitch decks and movie Bibles to query letters to connections and letters to executives at Pixar and more. We're just chasing every possibility that we can to have, create the movie. Have you seen 14 peaks? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Just I, recent. Yeah. And I, me as well. And I, last night, actually, yeah, I was listening to uh, Nims Purge's uh, interview with Joe Rogan. Have you okay. watched it? Uh-uh. I nope. highly recommend watching it considering where you are today. Yeah. And the reason why is he goes into detail of the story of creating 14 peaks. Hmm. And it was, a, you and him are like in a very similar place to a degree being yeah. that he was sharing that he was working in the special forces in the British army. And he just had this moment where he's like, I need to show people that impossible is possible. And without any money, without any, literally anything, he decides to quit his job and go figure out how to raise money and how to find a director, how to find everything, how to find a company to fund them and how to find a company to create it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And to watch that. he went the entire year literally having no idea what he was doing. And mm. what was beautiful about the story interesting to use the word beautiful is he had such a significant pressure on him because the money that he was making for the special forces was the money going to support his parents. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, I, think I do need to watch that. So I've been feeling lately, you know, that, that I do need to create that kind of pressure in my life because it, it really pushes in and, and uh, expedites growth. Right. 
Mm. Like sometimes it's so easy to get comfort. I've, I've worked, you know, I, I had a career during this whole time as I've been building this and it's getting to the point where time is running, running thin, we'll say like I'm busy. My calendar is full. And so there's been this, uh, and I'll, I'll be very open here. There's been this fear about letting go of that, that solid income. And, uh, but it's been, it's been foundational to create what we've created so far. However, that pressure, like he talked about, pushed him into another level. And, uh, and I think it's, you know, this is another journey that I'll get to go on is letting go of that, that safety net in a way to uh, really pushing and going for it because you have these obligations going back here and it's like, how do I meet those and, and create even more with no guarantee out here, right? Like, I don't know. But the giant doesn't need the guarantee out there because the giant right. has the guarantee inside. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm picturing you right now in an interview like this yeah. in a year, two years, three years, the time doesn't matter. And somebody asking you, well, what's your story? How did you create this film? And yeah. it's, I realized where I was playing the small and I became the giant by taking yeah. an epic risk. Yeah. Yeah. I could hear that. Yeah. I, you know, the beauty of the whole journeys of, of the giant's journey is it's never done there. You're never just, you don't become a giant and then you're done. There's no more work to do. Like there are other areas that you are still playing small. And so it's a constant journey of growing in every area that you can find. So, and the joy and the fun is it that you get to go out and look for those areas. Like you said, like one of these areas might be security, one of these areas might be relationship. One of these areas might be writing a book. Like I'm playing small over here. So how can I play giant in that? And you might get giant in that thing. And then you go back into the journey again for something else where you feel small. Like I'm not doing this. So where can I stretch and reach for that? Mm. What, like you said, the risk, I think of the story when he jumps out and he's got a knapsack with some cheese in it, some socks, and he goes on the path and there's no, there's no guarantee in front of him. That path is is a vital part of the journey is is letting go and stepping out there. And this whole journey has been some of that been stepping out into the unknown and it keeps growing. And every day, I don't know what the next step's going to be. I keep planning as much as I can plan with what I know, but I never know the actual next next step until I take it. And imagine so. imagine a life where we truly are always seeking mm -hmm. and courageously choosing the the discomforting act because I don't want to say it's not realistic but I think the process of growth in life is unconsciously yeah. falling into comfort in certain areas and there's yeah. so many areas of life that it's I'm hard so to glad do we're it on this path them. yeah yeah <laughs> thank you for this yeah you're right we do. We fall in comfort, even with the discomfort. I think it was Les Brown that came up with the story of the, the dog that was laying on the nail. He's on a farmer's porch and a neighbor comes up and the dog is whimpering. He says, why is he whimpering? He says, he's laying on a nail. So the other farmer asks, well, why doesn't he get off of it? And the farmer says, well, it doesn't hurt bad enough yet. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we do. We're, we're uncomfortable in our discomfort. We'll sit and be comfortable in our discomfort. And we'll do that for years and years and years and not get off the nail. And there will be a point where we either choose to get off of that nail or it becomes so uncomfortable that we've got to move, right? Like we can move before we, the nail hurts or we can move when the nail hurts. But the whole goal is to wake up. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, those signs are in a way easier when we're first starting our journeys in life to certain areas yeah. of success. But how yeah. about when, when we actually hit success? So what I mean by that is I'm picturing you, Nick, having a successful coaching practice, clients yeah. that you're inspired by, money coming in. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's not discomfort that is asking, hey, are you going to change? It's, well, what is actually the purpose? Yeah. What is your mission? What is your purpose? And yeah. just as an example, I have no idea. What if your bigger calling is this movie and the impact that leads to that? But because yeah. there is comfort in, well, I have all this money, I have these clients coming in, that, is, that makes it more challenging because there's not going to be any nails per se. Yeah, There's just yeah. going to be an inner knowing. Yeah, which, which in a, a term could be the nail in this case. It's it, it, in the vision of the movie, it could be you could find satisfaction or contentment in just having the idea of a vision of the movie. 
So it's like that vision becomes so comfortable that you don't do anything to create it. Does that make sense? Like the creation feels created because you had the vision, but, but there's no creation of that vision. So you become satisfied in the idea that, oh yeah, I have this great vision. You share that, but there's no activity toward it. It's just, you have this vision and that's what you share. So you feel comfort in sharing it. Mm. And so to get out there and really create it, it requires, man, it requires stepping into it, into the unknown. Like every day I'm looking at, okay, what's my next step? How do I do this? And I don't know the how <laughs> it's like, so what could we do that might have a high likelihood of creating this? And so I step on that. I have people reaching out now that are part of the journey. I think this is a big thing is collaboration, the giant's journey. Yeah. You might be the one doing the work, but it's not done alone. I mean, he stands on the shoulder of a giant and I've been lucky to stand on the shoulders of giants, not just one, this collaboration of people. Cause now people are invested in the vision with me and they're coming to me and saying, Hey, why don't you try this? I know this person, let's call them. Let's talk to them. You know, let's look at Walden media instead of Pixar. Let's look at some other producers. What if we crowdfunded this? Then you open up the possibilities. I think of 14 peaks where he couldn't get into China and it took all those people to create that. It wasn't mm. just him by himself. He couldn't have done that. So it was that collaboration and that collective consciousness towards his vision that created it as a reality. And I think in the past, I've always had this energy of, I've got to push through, I've got to be the one doing the work, I've got to do all of all of it, figure it out. And then that isolates, we're not designed for isolation, we're divine, we're designed and divined, we'll say, right, for collective connection and collaboration. So I love where this conversation is going. Thank you for this. This is awesome. So I'm curious, yeah. what, it, what, is, what specifically is awesome for you that you're like, oh, I'm actually really appreciating this dynamic. Man, what is being people, received? The, the people in my life that I have connection with. Mm. Um, I look at the community that we have, the tribe of giants and, and the closeness of everybody within that has become more of a family than anything. I'm grateful that I get to wake up in, in the morning and I'll get these messages through with people reading the book to their kids, uh, reading it for themselves, the, the uh, tributes and testimonials. I had one lady reach out, she's 73 years old and write a tribute for it. And she's like, this inspired me to go after my visions and dreams at 73. Like who does that? Right. At 73, we're all shutting down. And, and I'm curious within this conversation. Yeah. What I'm curious if there's anything being realized. Yeah. Take more risk. Yeah. What would that look like right now? Well, letting go of some of the security that I have, you know, which would really drive me to step out there even further. And, and by risk, I mean, financial risk for me, it would mm. be that letting go of that comfort, that security blanket that maybe would hold me back from getting to that next level that comfort and the discomfort that is, that is my awakening in this conversation. It's actually been coming up for quite a bit in a few conversations. It's interesting. What do you think it'll take for it to not have to come up in a conversation again? For me to get to that next level of comfort, <laughs> to <laughs> really just go for it to really be in the discomfort because hell you think about it we we trade off this security so this this comfort of i've got this thing and, and i want to hold on to it i don't want to let go it's like the monkey in the tree where they they won't let go of the banana in the hole in the tree and they come and capture them it's that idea that we get so caught up in our our comfort there really is no security in it there's this perceived perceived security but we are designed for uncertainty we're designed to step into the unknown the idea of certainty is foreign. That's not human. That's not what we do. We, there, there's nothing permanent in this world. And so the idea that, and this is me just diving into it with you, is the, the idea that things are going to last is, is a fallacy. Mm -hmm. Like relationships, we all die. Like at, at some point, we're going to do that. And so anything we create anyway is going to stay here or come apart at some point every invention becomes unraveled and, and a new invention is introduced. It's the cycle of life. It's the creation of life. There's, there's no guarantees. Like there's no certainties. It's not like you just get there and then you're done forever. 
So that's what I'm loving about this dialogue is just the, the vision of that is um, if you stay in the comfort, then you might feel like you have security, but there's no purpose. There's no drive and people without purpose tend to, to die off a little early, more like earlier than they need to. Especially inside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Yeah. I've been there. I know what that feels like. And uh, one thing, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts around this is, is um, when you get into that space of creation, you have your vision in mind and, you know, somebody gets into a survival state and in South Africa, I'm sure you see this quite a bit is a lot of people really buy into their survival state and that's all they can see, feel experiences is, is they're trying to put bread on the table and a roof over their heads and just the most basic needs. And uh, then they want to move from that into a creation of some sort. And their limitations around their survival state kind of get in the way. They either freeze or they run away from it or they fight it. And so they get stuck in the cycle of fighting what is and they don't create this new creation, which is possible for them. I would wonder in your world how you've experienced that as far as moving from that survival state. And I don't know if you've experienced that into the creative state. Does that make sense? Mm. So is that bridge, that bridge is the biggest challenge for most people. First, I have never literally been in that survival state. Mm. I have never literally been concerned about, will I have enough money? Will I be able to eat? So I can't answer that piece from my own experience, yeah. but I have yeah. experienced those energies. I have experienced the energy of fear. I've, yeah. I have experienced the energy of, I don't trust myself. I have yeah. experienced the energy of, I don't know how to take care of myself. So who can I reach out for, for help? Yeah. Yeah. And so, so hang on to that for a second. Okay. Because I want people to hear survival state isn't just about the physical needs, right? It's about the emotional. Some, some people are dealing with trauma and that puts them in that survival state. Some have really heavy emotions, like you said, anxiety or depression, and that will be a survival state because you're not at full function. So continue from there. So with my own journey, I think what changed was engaging in life in ways in which I felt valuable. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Because So I'll give you an example with my own story is yeah. I always knew I was meant to be a coach. From that deep inner knowing, I was still working through and being controlled by me doing it, not playing the victim of, I am not ready. I am not capable. I am not enough. So I was in, in this deep place of fear and scarcity because from there, I didn't believe I can create anything. Mm. And it was only until I made decisions and found myself and created opportunities for me to witness those skills that I believed I had. Mm. So I put myself in an opportunity where I could create who I wanted to be. And I went out and I worked in wilderness therapy, which hmm. is where I worked with, at, I don't know if you call them at-risk teenagers, but troubled teenagers dealing with substance abuse, suicide attempts, self-harm, anger management. And being with those teenagers, I saw the gifts that I believed I had. So from there, it was just like this snowball effect of by being inexperienced with who I believed I could be, there wasn't any space for I'm not enough, I'm not capable because I was, I saw it and I experienced it and felt it within. And it was literally being reflected back to me in people mm. sharing how I was impacting them and their lives yeah. were transforming. So how to get out of that scarcity mode is creating experience, however possible to feel the empowerment of the self. Beautiful. Yeah. I like that purpose. You know, let's talk about purpose for a minute is purpose is whatever you want it to be. It's made up and you don't just have one. So we talk about this grand purpose and I've had conversations with people where it's around the idea of some grand purpose. 
And the word purpose means to rest. It's a place to rest. If you go look up the etymology of it and the origins of the word, it's, it's a place to pause. And so when you find that place to rest, you might rest for a minute, get comfortable, be satisfied, right? It's what we do when we rest. And then we re-engage with another purpose. And so we move toward that next place of, of rest. And so having that purpose gives meaning to life and value, right? And it could be anything. So when you feel that value, then you move toward it. If you don't feel that value, then you don't, you don't put energy, energy into it. It's not like it's not valuable. It's just simply, you don't feel like it's in alignment with you or you don't believe it. And so you don't put energy into it. So there's no creation around it. And Mm. so now it's just a dream. Like I would, I wish I could have that. I would love to have that. Those are the words we use, but there's no activity toward it. And I think when you have that purpose blended with belief, right. Then, then you take action because with belief and hope you have energy and without it, you have no energy. And mm. people physically say that I am tired. I don't know what to do. I've, I'm frozen. I'm stuck. I don't, you know, I don't believe my life can change from what it is to that. And so as coaches, I think we have this chance to really put them on our shoulders and say, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You can do it. Huh? What's coming up there? the word experience yeah, is that people who are disconnected from purpose, they think it's this, this big thing that they need to grab onto as opposed mm-hmm. to just having a moment of experiencing purpose Yeah, because I can't communicate through words and convey purpose. Someone needs to experience purpose. What I can be doing is experiencing purpose within, and then somebody can be feeling through experience what purpose feels like. Yeah. The reason I think this is so significant is because once somebody experiences purpose, they forever know what purpose is and they can know that they're not in it. So for example, for a long time in my life, I didn't understand gratitude, literally. Like I'm like, okay, I know the definition of it, but in every area of my life, I cannot connect to the experience of gratitude. Yeah. I was really fortunate. I grew up in a family where all of my needs were met. So when yeah. people would say, be grateful for the food on your plate, I'm like, okay, intellectually, I'm grateful, but I'm not experiencing it. Okay. And everything changed for me when I had the experience of gratitude for the first time. And all it took was that one experience and forever. I'm like, I got it. I know gratitude uh, now. Yeah. And I was at like a movement uh, workshop and we were doing like four hours of the training outside in Philadelphia. And it was like 40 degrees and raining. And I was so uncomfortable and so cold and couldn't wait for it to end. And there was a yoga studio that opened up and we were able to go do the rest of the workshop in the studio and walking into this warmth, walking into this comfort. I was like, I am so grateful to be warm and comfortable. And that was the aha. Oh, to experience gratitude for me, I need the opposite. So for me to experience always, for me to be grateful for always having food on my plate, the opposite of not having food on my plate, I will be able to connect to it deeper. I don't want to communicate that it has to be this way just for me. So when I experienced being of value, that's all that I needed. When I experienced purpose for the first time, that's all I needed and now the path was clear. Yeah, I see. I I look at the word experience as a verb, which it, it is. You talk talk about experiential learning, which a lot of us have gone through. But experience is a definition that we give to an event. So you had an event in your life, and then you made it mean something, and then that meaning something became your belief system, and then that belief system became your driver or non driver of the the larger system, which was your purpose, your creation. But the experience was, it was made up. It was created. You, you went into an event, the event, somebody else could have had the same event and had a different experience because they would have had a story that said, it's not what you just described. It's something else. And they would have lived into that. And so the experience is also created. So it's the meaning that we give to the event, whatever that event is. 
And we all have a chance to take these small wins, like you say, and turn it into a foundation or an experience of gratitude or something else, and then use that as a foundation to grow even more. I think as humans, we have this social desire to show off or compare. And we want to get into this space of, well, yeah, I want to lose 10 or 20 pounds. I was watching a video yesterday on that. And the guy, I loved what he said. He said, lose one, make Mm -hmm. one your purpose, one pound. And then go for the next pound and the next. You didn't gain weight 10 pounds at a time. It didn't just come on like that. It came on over time gradually. Mm. And for some people, it comes on quicker. But the losing of it is one pound at a time. It's You have one experience, like you say, of gratitude, and that becomes a foundation for the next step. And, and so the Giants and the Smalls is all designed around that small step. Giants still take small steps. They're just bigger. They, they just have more capacity. So their small steps look like giant steps to somebody who's not there. But it's still, it's that little incremental growth that I think moves us from, like you say, that, that feeling of defeat or energetic loss to the creation of purpose. Is that, am I hearing you? Yeah. What's, what, I, what I'm, what's coming up for me and hearing you is that what we choose to have in our awareness choose is going to be the lens that we're looking through. So because I was in my awareness, I had this idea of this concept of gratitude. It came in existence through that. So if I have in my awareness purpose, right? How many people say, I don't have a purpose. I don't know where to look for purpose. The question is, well, how often are you holding purpose in your consciousness so that you can see the world through those lens and then have the experience come back? And I'm just thinking about like the magic of the giants and the smalls is by having that in consciousness, all of a sudden, I am going to observe way more frequently and notice these opportunities. Okay, am I being small here or am I being giant here? Yeah. And that is going to create tremendous change. Yeah. Even at the beginning of the story, when he's lived a life, he lived a life. I mean, if you'll go back and read it, he lived a full life as a small. I mean, had a house, a job, a career, the same paths every day, ate pea soup every day and crackers. He had a full life as a small. Then he had this awakening moment. And then his purpose became in that moment, finding out if smalls become could become giants that became the purpose it wasn't a huge purpose it wasn't about doing something great in the world it was can smalls become giants that became the purpose figuring that out and so we went on an unknown path took that risk like you're talking about a lot of uncertainty how is this going to go i have no idea he just knew he wanted to talk to the giants and then when he talked to the giant the giant opened up his vision Now his purpose moved to creating himself as that. Now he found out that one purpose was complete in the idea that, yes, smalls can become giants. In fact, all giants were born small. And so now knowing that that was the case, his next purpose became, how do I become one? And so he moved toward it. And that's how purpose works. I've seen people who run multi-million dollar businesses who've accomplished something huge and they're depressed because they don't have a purpose. They don't have a, a next thing. They've done the thing. The biggest thing that people would look at and they would compare it and they would say, that's phenomenal. And they would measure it and say, yeah, you, you did it. You made it. But in making it, they go to depression because I don't have a, a reason to keep, like you said, the value. I don't feel valued. Did they make it? So this is the imagery yeah, that's yeah. coming up for me. I'm picturing myself like starting my journey. I'm this small. And in my imagination ahead of me, there's these like a hundred mannequins of giants. Hmm. And I get to choose as a small, which giant I become. And the question is, which giant is truly me? Because I can choose from that small place that I want to be the giant of a corporate executive and go down that path. But was I meant to become that giant? Or was that giant something that was conditioned into me as a small? And then I get to that corporate executive and it's like, oh, this isn't the giant that I wanted to be. What giant do I want to be? Yeah. I I look at that. Can I dive down that rabbit hole? And how are we on time? Are we good? Yeah, we have 30 minutes. 
Okay. So the, the idea of goals, you know, like you, you get this goal and you become that executive and it's not the path, the ultimate path, but it was a path that you took. Mm -hmm. And so you switch and you bifurcate and you go down another path and you create something else. Mm -hmm. I see our lives more like trees than anything else, because a tree, it has its roots, it has its trunk, and then everything else is messy. And it's amazing because even though it's messy, it still produces fruit. And so even though a branch went down one certain way, the tree doesn't call itself a failure because it took a path and created a branch called become the executive. No, it grows another branch and then it becomes that. And then it grows another branch and it becomes that and it bifurcates and branches out and our lives are like that. The whole thing is a success. There's none of that. You wouldn't look at a single branch on a tree and judge it as a failure. Oh, it broke off at the end. That's a failure of a tree, but every other branch is healthy. It's just, there's a chance to pivot and switch and move in another direction. So yeah, one path doesn't work out. You find out, you go down the path of executive and you find out that's not what you want to do. So you, you pivot, you switch, and you bifurcate, you start putting the energy into a new path. You might find that one doesn't work. But the, the idea is you keep branching and bifurcating and growing. Because the whole tree as a whole, when you look back down the road, you'll look back and go, holy crap, dude, I did succeed. You will. But if you judge the branch, the tree by the branch, you're, you're going to be a failure. You got to put all this energy into this branch and it failed. And you judge it by that. Like I've been down that road. I've done things and I've thought, man, there's no way this ties into my bigger vision. I didn't know what my bigger vision was until I took the steps. And even now, I think I might know my bigger vision, but I'll get going down this road and there might be a different vision that comes up. So I think the limiting ourselves to a single purpose is the problem. We're more like trees. We have myriad purposes. We have myriad places to go. There's an and so that's for me. where I'm at. Go ahead. The if is, I'm also imagining with this, like, yeah. you call this a metaphor? <laughs> An imagery yeah, that yeah. you're sharing? Yes, oh my yeah. God. I don't even know what a metaphor is. <laughs> <laughs> now you do. Now you no, have I'm, experience. I'm like messing it. around. No, I'm not messing yeah. around. I know what it is. I just don't know the definition. That's fine. I'll yeah, Google it when good. we're done with this yeah. call. Is Perfect. The if is, am I taking giant steps or am I taking small steps? And I don't yeah. mean giant as, size i mean as courage and yeah. if i'm taking courageous sizes my tree is going to grow higher versus yeah. am i taking yeah and for some steps? people what you and i might judge as a small step is a giant step for them and so i think the biggest thing is step just step and keep stepping and do it consistently and give it time you know like groundhog day the movie it's like it feels like the same damn day over and over again, but you're expanding and you're growing and it is changing. So step, step. So Nick, I'm curious just to kind of segue this a bit into talking about Steve, talking about the impact of the ultimate yeah. coach entitled the book of being yeah. <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> so you got to meet Steve first. I want to know how yeah. being Nick shifted in that moment. And then I'd love to know how being Nick shifted from the impact of reading the book. Yeah. So a couple of things. So that, that was my first experience of him back in 2009 and he hasn't left my side. Steve still stays in touch and contacts me here and there. And he's a good human. He just, he just, he doesn't have an agenda for you, you know, other than your, your highest self. And so that first experience of him was, uh, it was eye opening to me that that was even in the world because I hadn't experienced anything like that. It would, it would be akin to having a conversation with Jesus in my mind and I'm not religious, but to have that conversation with somebody of that stature and that ability to hold space for you, that's what it felt like. And there's just complete acceptance, Like you are where you are in your life and you're capable of more. And then going through the book really brought home the idea that Steve is a human being. So like there's this God aspect that we give a person like that in that position of, wow, they're great. You know, they're greater than I am in a way we, we turn them into, into gods in our mind. But then you go and read his book and you're like, this dude's an effing human. Like he is, 
he is as human as it gets. He's gone through the struggles and trials that every one of us gets to go to. And he created himself out of that. So to be able to go through his journey, especially the first half of the book where he goes through his journey of his childhood, his development, his dad, and, and to see him wish his dad happy birthday and tell him thank you for all that he created for him, because without that experience, he wouldn't be who he is today, really just anchors home that my childhood wasn't a punishment. My development wasn't a punishment. I wouldn't be who I am today without it. So he demonstrates that. He's like, I'm just like you. And I create myself as this. He's powerful. Is and how about from reading the book? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's from reading the book is his journey from reading the book. Cause I didn't know that. So, because, so sorry. I meant in, I meant in, in you and in your yeah. creation process and, oh, and who is Nick now yeah. from witnessing so in, him? Yeah. So I, I am, I'm trying to follow in his footsteps. You know, it's like when I was little, I remember stepping in the snow and my brothers would be out in front of me and they had these big strides. And as a kid, I was trying to keep up and put my feet in their footsteps to keep up. And I couldn't. And uh, what I've learned with Steve is, is how to be in a way that really serves others. My way of being has moved into listening more, not telling what I know, but listening to sit with a client and really be with them. Mm. Um, to be, be that and hold that space that he held for me for them. So as they step into their journey, that they've got room to be where they are, because they are, they are there, there's no changing it. And then to put them on my shoulder and stand up and show them, look, let's look at this. And what about this? And let's check this possibility. So if I'm listening to this right now, and I'm like, Ooh, yeah. I want to, I want somebody to hold space like that for me. I want to hold space yeah. like that for somebody. What are the yeah. characteristics and qualities that you experienced? And that you give? Yeah. Well, just compassion, empathy for the situation. Some of the, the stories that I've heard, you know, around trauma, around financial difficulties, around divorce, you know, these things that really we allow to define us is uh, having somebody that can just hold space for that without the judgment to come into that room and sit there and not feel judged around it, um, to be able to talk about anything in that space and know that it's safe. So having that quality of security within that conversation that you can say anything and it's not going to impact our relationship and then also helping them to hear themselves. So that ability to not share all of the knowledge, but that'll come up as it's needed, but to really hear them and have them hear them. So that quality of in dialogue, getting them to hear themselves because that's where the change is going to come in. So it's not about what I create in them. It's what they create in them when they hear themselves, like the words of Carl Rogers, how he would say his voice will go with you. And, but he would have people hear themselves and in hearing themselves, they would solve their problems and they would, they would go out in the world and change their lives. Can you share a specific, like an example of what that means Yeah, to, I mean, to help yeah. somebody hear themselves? Yeah. I have somebody recently I won't share names, um, has gone through a lot of trauma in her life. And, um, you know, we would sit in conversation. She said that nobody has been able to hold space like that for her. She's been through years and years of therapy and hasn't been able to shift this and to create that acceptance, not only over here, but to teach her how to create acceptance in her own world. She says that she's got friends now recognizing that she's different. She feels at peace with what is what happened in her life. And we're talking about traumas. Traumas are pretty severe on people. They impact how we show up for a long time, maybe forever. And um, she was able to, to talk through these openly without having to hold back and have some, some acceptance within, within that sharing. There's no shame in it. So she doesn't need any more shame. So we just sit and have a conversation around that. And then she was able to implement it back into her life. And people are noticing is there something specific though that you're doing in that conversation that she is hearing what she's saying? Yeah. I, I, as far as like a tactic. Yeah. Um, if I were to really narrow a tactic down, it would be, can you hear that? I would feed back their mm. words in a different form and ask if they hear that and what they hear inside of that and what's in there for them. Mm -hmm. Because they might have a listening going on that keeps them from hearing themselves and what I'm sharing. 
So I want to check in frequently with what do you hear? What's in there for you? And what did you hear in what I just shared? Because now they can bring it back into their world and hear, and I can check and see if we're in alignment with what I'm trying to create with them. Brilliant. So as a tactic, that would be how difficult it is. It's simple, but it, mm -hmm. that's, that's what it is. Is what are you hearing? It's convert It's basic, like basic conversation, right? Sadly, sadly, yeah. it's that basic. And almost all of us did not get to grow up in that space. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, Ross is, as you look at that in a conversation, do you feel safe in the conversation? What's being heard on both sides? I went through Brandon, uh, Brandon Craig's Ontecore program on the model of relating. And um, the biggest thing that he talked about was communication. And what are you hearing from over on their side of the fence? And are we having an understanding? Are we seeing the same thing? It doesn't mean I agree with you. Just simply, do I hear what you're hearing? Do I see what you're seeing? And then once I can do that and be in their space where I can hear and see the world the way they see and hear the world, now we can create something. Because until I can hear and see the world the way they do, there's nothing to do. There's no way to create from that. Because we're, we have two different understandings trying to come together and create. I simply want to put myself in their world and hear them and, and experience, like you said, what it's like to be in their world and operate from that space. And in that, you find your solutions. What would you share with somebody right now who is listening to this and saying, I want to be able to do that? Yeah. I don't know if I ever have, how can I grow in that ability? It's a skill. It's a skill. So that means you can learn it. Well, that's a beautiful thing because now you go find the people that do teach that like Carl Rogers, Carl Jung, some of the other greats who are psychologists and therapists that actually that's what they do for their, their careers. And you go learn from them and you develop the skill and you practice it. And at first you're terrible at it. And then as you practice, you get better and better, just like everything else in life. So go develop the skill. You have the mindset for it. So now like James Malachek, he says, go create the skill for it. I think what's interesting is when there is something that we should have naturally received, but we mm. didn't, now we need to intentionally create the skill. Whereas I'm yeah. imagining if I grew up in a household, which I didn't, where space was just a natural passing down, right? Imagine like creating yeah, yeah. space is what was conditioned into me. Then it might've been this natural knowing, this natural skill set of, well, I think yeah. it's just like learning a language as a child, right? You don't need to learn the skill yeah. of learning a language as an adult because you were just very malleable and received it. So yeah. people need to take ownership and realize that it's not just going to happen if it wasn't there already. Yeah. The beauty is it's not the, the quick path. Like the quick path would be you take a course and over a weekend, you've got the skill mastered, right? This is decades of practice. You know, this goes back to that conversation with Steve and then having conversations with others and doing coaching and being terrible at it and, and looking at how do I help people from where they are and looking into the people that align with the way I want to do it, which is unique. Mm. You know, you have your way and it's also unique. And then taking time to practice that in the dialogue, in the conversation until I master it. And then I want to go find out where else am I small and I want to bring that in and master that, right? But it's you, as a child, you think about this. It's not like you missed the steps of mastery. It's just you weren't aware of it. It was just naturally there because it was your environment and your culture. So it just, it didn't feel like learning because it was just the way things were. But now as we're older, it feels like learning because we've got to go through the steps of creating it for ourselves. So that I think it's very important to develop skills around things. We are humans. I'm curious right now for yeah. listeners to hear the question, do I want to master listening? How many people would say yes? And then separately ask the question, do you want to be loved? And do you want to give love? Mm. And I'm curious if people realize that all three of those are the exact same thing. You can't receive mm. love and you can't give love in my eyes if you haven't mastered or at least are committed to developing listening because listening is how humans love. Yeah, I like that. I like that because we create acceptance and understanding. 
I, I, if I were to create one word for love, it would be acceptance. And I don't know that you can just do one word for love, but acceptance comes within listening, right? Like you're saying, it comes within listening because in that listening, you can have an understanding and you can have acceptance. It doesn't mean that you agree with it. It just simply means I can hold space for that to be what it is because it is. So and, anything outside of that, yeah, go ahead. And I like the word accepting because for me to be present with you, like listening is being present with you, at, at least an aspect yeah. of it. it. In a way, I need to constantly be accepting myself because in communicating yeah. with another, things are going to come up inside. And presence is lost when something comes up inside and then it takes my distraction away. And yeah. if I'm just constantly accepting, okay, that's there loving it, forgiving it, accepting it, loving it, forgiving yeah, it. Yeah. I'm present and I'm listening and I'm loving. Yeah. Yeah. I think most of our fight is around non-acceptance around resistance because we don't like ourselves. We shouldn't be here. We have an ideal. We have depression around that ideal that we hold internally. We have anxieties around the ideals that we think others have that we've projected on them. And so we judge ourselves from that. So we feel anxiety and depression and we, we don't, we're not present. How can you be present? When you're in depression or anxiety, you're in the past or the, or the future. And so really being in a space of it is what it is, it's, it gives it room for it to be what it is, and it creates peace around it. And that peace becomes a foundation for everything else you create. Because when you're at peace with what is, there's nothing you can't create. But when you're in resistance to it, it's, you're just busy fighting the resistance. You're busy fighting what is. But it is. It's such a paradox. It is what it is. You're fighting that it is what it is, as though it shouldn't be there, but it is there. You put it there. You create it there. It's not a judgment or a shaming. It's just simply it is. And then from that, once you create peace with that, then people move. And that's what I do with conversations. We create peace with what is. And the paradox to that is you think if you accept what is, that your life is going to be like that forever. It doesn't work that way. I've yet to see it work that way. When you truly get okay with what is, you start to create it differently and more powerfully. Because you yeah. are different and more powerful. <laughs> yeah. In that very already. Act. Yeah. Yeah. So Nick, as yeah, we I, begin to wrap up here. Yeah. What are the areas in your life right now where you're like, yeah, I could take some giant steps there. The movie. That'd be one, right? Absolutely. Uh, career. That would be a giant one because I've had a career through this whole thing. And so I built my coaching practice and done a career, done both. I've been an and, and human. So that would be another big one is to make that transition. Third is relationship. You know, I got divorced in 2019. I feel a lot of hesitation around it, a lot of smallness when it comes to relationship. And so really taking on relationship would be another one doing the healing. I feel really small there. I feel, you know, those insecurities of, that history and that story and the experiences that comes up for me. So those would be the areas. The book is done. It's complete. It's in my hands, right? Yeah. Now it's just distribution. So it's not as exciting as like the movie because it's not in my hands. It's like, it's an unknown. And so that's where the fun is. So AKA to all the listeners yeah. out there, if there's any giant lovers out there, you know where to find him. Yeah. <laughs> no, please not yet. <laughs> it's in this setting up that I've had the most uh, difficult experiences. <laughs> yeah, hold Nick. on for a minute. I'll tell you when I'm ready for that. <laughs> Do you uh, have you. any final messages for the listeners? Be gentle with yourself. Yeah, the process of becoming a giant isn't a thing of comparison. It's an internal journey. And so be gentle with yourself because... Your judgments of you are what kind of get in the way of everything else. So if you can be gentle and, and learn to accept and love what is, and then be at peace with it, then you're going to create greater things, I think. So the more you fight what is, that's that's the hard thing. And the more you fight yourself and judge yourself for being where you are, that's that's where it really gets difficult. And so that's why I say be gentle. Take it easy on yourself. Nick, the gentle giant. Yeah. <laughs> Nick, thank you so yeah. much for this time. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for listening. If you know someone who would benefit from today's conversation, please share this podcast with them. Also, 
we invite you to visit theultimatecoachbook.com so you can continue your personal exploration of being. There you will find links to join our wonderful community, get your own copy of The Ultimate Coach Book, and more. Simply go now to www.theultimatecoachbook.com. That's www.theultimatecoachbook.com. The link is also available in the show notes. We appreciate your support. Be blessed. Be used.